All right, so if you have your Bible, go ahead, turn. Second Thessalonians, we're continuing our series. We're part 12 today, talking about prayer and the Word. So Second Thessalonians, chapter 3, and we're just going to look at the first five verses today as this, these verses sum up a lot of Paul's thoughts for us and the Holy Spirit's direction to us today. So ministry and missions is hard work. And many have been battered and bruised, discouraged and defeated along the way. It has been this way since the creation, the dawn of creation, and continues this way to this very day. But the kingdom of God still advances by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. To those who have given themselves to courageously advancing the cause of Christ in our communities into every corner of creation. It continues to advance on the world because that is the will of God. And we are, as we read in First and Second Thessalonians, to greatly rejoice whenever the gospel seed takes root and churches are established and growing. Paul continues to remind us of these things. Now, Thessalonica City, okay, um, was one of those places where this had taken place. And so Paul and his companions continued to pray for, encourage, and strengthen this newborn church in this city. And he explained to them many facets of the faith and provided specific information about the coming of the Lord. And we've seen that in weeks past. So he continued to minister to them by the Spirit of God. Now his main concern for them is that they would continue to grow in love for one another and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This was his primary concern. Will the root of the gospel continue to grow? Will their faith continue to increase and their love for each other grow in the midst of deep and difficult circumstances? So these believers were facing this and he continued to pray for them that they would grow broader and wider and fuller. And, of course, he instructed them about some questions they had about this man of lawlessness. Apparently, there was a rumor that had gone around that Jesus' return already happened. And they were agitated. They were concerned. So Paul, as a good shepherd, tried to calm them and comfort them, saying that it will be okay. Now, in our chapter today, Paul then prays for them, and then he asks those newborn believers to pray for him and his companions and the ministry of the word. Now, let's, let's think about this a little bit. Here was a called, trained, mature, gifted apostle asking these infants in Christ to pray for him. Just let that sink in a little bit, okay? Here was Paul the Apostle, right? Who saw the Lord Jesus, who was trained in the Old Testament scriptures, who was zealous in faith and given himself over to learning these things and spread the gospel of Christ. He was asking these newborn believers to pray for him. Why? Because their prayers were just as effective as his. Not because they were better prayers, but because they were all praying to the same God who answers. That should be helpful to you. It's not the quality of our prayer that matters, but to whom we're praying to that matters. This is what he is saying. You don't have to be a trained theologian to access God. God invites us. To connect with him. He implores us. In some places, he even seems to beg us to give him our burdens, to give him our fears, to make requests known to him. God does that 
all the time. And you would think that Paul, who was gifted enough, trained enough, supported enough to be able to handle the ministry of his own, right? And you would think if there was anyone who didn't need prayer, it would be Paul. But the truth is that spiritual work must be done by spiritual means. Yes, he did need to be prepared. He did need to study and handle the word well. But you see all over the New Testament that we see the coupling of prayer and the ministry of the word. Always it's the ministry of the word connected to prayer. It's never separated in the New Testament. The apostles devoted themselves to prayer and ministry of the word, Acts 6, 4. Repeatedly all over scripture, the churches were asked to pray for the ministry of the word. And I have references in your notes for you to look at later. Now, Paul mentions prayer 41 times in his 13 letters to the churches. In fact, there are 650 prayers listed in the Bible. 450 recorded answers to prayer. The Gospels record Jesus praying 25 times times. And the only recorded thing the disciples asked Jesus to teach them was to preach. Oh wait, that's not right. We don't, we don't, we don't see recorded in scripture that, that the disciples say, teach us to preach. We don't see that. We don't see the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to cast out demons, even though they did that. We don't see the disciples asking Jesus, teach us how to heal. <laughs> what we do read, the one thing that they asked him, is teach us to pray. Why? I believe that the disciples observed Jesus as they lived together for at least three years. They saw everything he did. And from that connection, they came to the conclusion that the source of who he was, the source of his power, was through his times of intimacy with the Father. Right? Repeatedly, time and time again, we see Jesus going aside to pray. And if Jesus, the very Son of God, needed to spend time in prayer, who do you think you are that you don't need to? And if you think if anyone didn't need to pray, it was Jesus. But yet repeatedly, Jesus went out to a lonely place. Repeatedly, Jesus went away and prayed. Repeatedly are these records of Jesus' Jesus's praying. And so the disciples realize this. Lord, teach us how to pray. And by the way, the Lord's Prayer isn't necessarily a prayer. Okay, It is a way of praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, okay? It is a, a, a way that we pray. We pray that God's name would be glorified. We pray that we be delivered from evil. We pray that we would be given what we need for provision. We pray that our sins would be forgiven, that we would be right with God, and that we would forgive others of their trespasses against us. We'd be right with other people. And so prayer is a significant element of Scripture. And prayer must be a significant element of our lives. Why do we pray? We pray because God sees. We pray because God hears. We pray because God cares. We pray because God acts. We pray because God invites us to have an audience with Him. We pray because prayer is the mechanism that God uses to partner with his people to glorify himself and accomplish his will in the world. Amen. That's what he chooses to do. Right? We pray to access God's heart and to receive provision from his hand. We pray to partner with what God is doing in the world. We pray to combat our pride for thinking that we have the power to do his will on our own. How do you like them apples, right? You 
can't do God's will in your own strength. Because if you could, you wouldn't need God. This is how he sets it up. We pray for power to do the work that he's called. We pray to acknowledge our dependence upon God. We pray because we're limited and God is not. Prayer is a powerful weapon to bring down spiritual strongholds and to accomplish what only he can do. You ever notice that the one thing, if you lack in your spiritual life, it's, it's your prayer life? You ever notice that? <clears throat> I've found that to be true about myself. That I'll get caught up in something, or I'll, I'll get so busy, and then I think, well, I'll do that later. I'll, I'll do that as I go. And is it important to pray as you go? The answer, of course, is yes. But there are times in which we must get on our knees, and I would recommend this often. I would recommend this daily, because it is our life. And let's not be foolish to think that God's will for your life, or the will for this congregation, will happen without prayer. Well, you know, if our advertising's good enough, they will come. Right? Well, you know, if our, if our pews are padded enough, they will sit. <laughs> if our building is updated enough, they will like it. If our location is just so right. right? Or if the tone is perfect, or the pastor's hair is just so suave. Thank you for that laughter, and I'm sweating. That's disgusting. <laughs> we focus on all of those things, right? And we neglect what's most important. The Lord of the Word to fill the house of the Lord. God can change hearts. I could preach my guts out, and can fall on deaf ears. I know that. Paul the Apostle, who you can't say was a poor preacher, he would preach, and people sometimes would fall asleep and fall out windows. Remember that? I can't change hearts. I can't change minds. I can't transform anybody. God does that. And this is why we pray, right? You don't have the wisdom enough to change the mind of a spouse who doesn't believe. God can do that. So we pray. Yes, do we prepare? Of course, we live the word, but we pray, God, do these things. And Paul understood this. And so he implored the church to pray. This newborn, struggling church, Paul prayed for them all the time. He prayed for them. We see this. He prayed for them, prayed for them, prayed for them. Read any of his epistles. He's praying, he's praying, he's praying, he's praying, he's praying. And he asks them to pray, 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 pray. Right? Why? Because we overcome through these things. And so we're going to see that this morning. And all of that is introduction to what he's asking us to do. So this morning, the very word of God will instruct you, us, how we are to pray, okay? And what we are to honor, to see the power of God working in your life, in our midst, and the ministry of this church. So here's the first point. Pray, the message spreads Rapidly, This is what Paul talks about, okay? We're going to see this. Again, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to work through these five verses. As for other matters, okay? Paul then is turning his focus. Talked about the man of lawlessness. You can go back and read that in chapter 2. It says, now for other matters, okay? Now that we've talked about this, we're turning to this other things. Brothers and sisters... Pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly. So you just put a bullet point there. If 
I'm praying, we should pray, number one, the message of the Lord spreads rapidly, which literally means that the message of the Lord runs. It moves. It's not crawling. It's not lagging behind. It moves quickly. So why do we need to pray this? Why do we need to pray that God's message was spread quickly? Why the urgency? First, because of lost time. Those of you who came to faith later in life, don't you wish that you came to faith earlier? Right? There's an urgency. Those who came to faith as a young child and never got into drugs or alcohol or violence or blah, 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 filling all these sinful things, that's a great testimony. There are people today in your family, in our community, they urgently need to hear the message of the gospel to save their soul and to save them from all of these destructful, hurtful, demonic things that take place. There's an urgency. Paul's saying, may the, may the message go urgently, may spread rapidly, and often we forget about the urgency that people need to hear the gospel. Okay. Well, I'll tell them at some other time. I'll just wait, right? A month goes by, a year goes by, a decade goes by. I have a friend of mine, his name is Dave Yeomans. He's a Gideon. Just adding this in, okay? He works at a company called Area Rectors right down here, okay? I met him through another church. He's a good friend of mine, okay? And if you hear his testimony, he came to faith around 50 years old due to some amazing circumstances. And he became radically saved. And then he started to find out that his co-worker was a Christian, and he found out that a family member was a Christian. And he found out a bunch of other people were Christians. And his message to them is, why did you not tell me? You've been my friend for 30 years, and you didn't tell me this? Dave's a radical evangelist. I remember when I came, really came to Christ when I was 17. I knew the gospel when I was young. It's my story. 17, okay? I turned into a kamikaze Christian, right? And some of that was good. Some of it wasn't good. Zeal without knowledge is not necessarily a good thing, but I was zealous. And I figured, I was a senior in high school, that I had only a certain amount of time before I probably would not see most of these people again. Right? And so I went after it. All my t-shirts, man. You opened up my locker and the glory of the Lord appeared, right? <laughs> I had all these little sayings, stuff like that. I'd open up my locker. Hello. Now, I learned a lot since that time. But I'm not going to look back at myself and get on myself for being zealous and urgent. At times, I wish I was more zealous and more urgent. So Paul understood that there was an urgency. And there was an urgency in his day, and there's an urgency today. Right? When's the last time that you prayed that the gospel would spread rapidly? I bet you haven't prayed that. Right? I haven't prayed that very much. I'm praying it now. <laughs> And I'm asking you to pray it now. When you're praying about the message of the gospel, pray that it spreads rapidly because if it doesn't, people have lost time and been given over to depravity. Second, there are people in places who have never heard the gospel. <laughs> Billions of people that do not have the light of hope that we see in the face of Christ. 
There's an urgency that is there. And Paul recognized this and said, pray that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly. Third, their um, resistance to the rapid spread of the gospel. There's closed borders. There's closed doors. There's closed minds. Impediments to the gospel. Places and people that want to slow its spread. So we pray that it will spread rapidly. We pray that there will be open borders, there will be open doors, there will be open minds to this message. And all of these impediments, these hurdles that governments and people and individuals put up, and they put them up all the time. Burning churches. Cutting out tongues of pastors and evangelists. This is literally happening today. Holding hostage or spreading falsities about the gospel. So pray, okay, pray for anything. We have to be a church that prays. The power is not in the music, it's not in the preaching, it's in the prayer. This becomes enhanced because we are praying to the God who answers prayer. I don't want people to come here and think, wow, isn't the music great and isn't the preaching great? I want them to say, surely God is among them. That only happens if we ask God. God, move, change, speak to us. So I'm asking you to pray because the gospel asks you to pray. Paul asks us to pray. The Holy Spirit he says, pray, and here's how I want you to pray. Number one, pray. The message spreads rapidly. So we pray that there be urgency in our hearts. And that urgency would come because of the love of God and love of people. Not out of shame, and boy, I should do this, not out of guilt. Because we love God and His goodness, and we love people, and we want them to know each other. Right? So urgency comes from love, and love comes from grace. So God, give us this. So please pray this way. Paul asks that church, and God is asking this church to pray that way. Second, pray. The message is honored deeply. This is, this is good. Paul recognized that it needs to go out quickly, but then it needs to go in deeply. Pray the message is honored deeply. 2 Thessalonians, second part of verse 1 of chapter 3. And be honored just as it was with you. Brother matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord be spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you. And we know that about the Thessalonians. They took it in. So it's not enough for the message to be spread rapidly. We pray that the Lord, the message of the Lord, is honored, that people receive this message and honor it as the very word of God. Not everyone who reads the Bible, hears the message, recognizes that there's God's voice who is calling. This was the one thing that Paul commended these people in this city, right? This is 1 Thessalonians 2.13. We also thank God, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And we also thank God constantly for this. That when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it... Not as the word of men, but as what it really is. The word of God, which is at work in you believers. So when people understand the message, and they understand that this is not a message of men, but the message of the one true creator, they respond to it differently. It's true. Okay? And some people that just think that this book is just a man-made collection of moral theological sayings, and they dismiss it, or deconstruct it, or dissect it, 
or pick and choose. Well, I like this part, but I don't like that part. Right? But you've never done that, probably. <laughs> it is a powerful and meaningful and life-changing event when people recognize that the word that's being proclaimed is not the word of a preacher, but the very word of God. And so he says, pray. Go back to the text. That the word is honored. That it is honored. That it is honored. Honored in the heart. When they hear the message, they recognize it's the word of God. And then people make room for it in their hearts. And they place it in a sacred place. In their home of their heart. Talk about it. Live by it. Show it off to others. How do you honor the Word of God? Is it something that you have stacks of Bibles up? I have more Bibles than some countries. I have a lot of Bibles. If we went in here and we all bought our Bibles at home, I bet you we have a big stack. The question is not do we have it, but is it honored? Do you honor it? Do you honor it, really? If you honor it, then you recognize that it is above you. If you honor it, you say, I'm going to line my life up to it versus trying to get it to line itself up to you. Are you hearing me? You say, God, what are you saying? What are you speaking? And if you say it, I'm going to believe it, even if it's not popular. And everything that's written in this book isn't popular today. Do you honor the word? Do we honor the word? Do we look to it and say, this is God's word? And God, I put myself under your word and I place it into my heart. Do we do that? Because hearing is one thing, but honoring is another. And so everyone needs to have an opportunity to hear. And the prayer then also is that the word will be honored. And I pray that for my family. I pray that for myself. I pray that for my community. I pray that for this church, that we would be people of prayer and people who honor the word. God works in this world. Way because the Word of God is living and active. If you want to catch a virus, catch the virus of the Word of God. This is why we honor it. And Paul says, pray for us. Pray that the message goes rapidly. And pray that the message is honored deeply. So I want you to pray for that. Pray that every church in Rockford, the word of God is honored. Because every church in Rockford does not honor the word. Every religious institution does not honor it. That it would be honored. And we would submit ourselves to it. Pray that the message is honored deeply. Thirdly, he he tells us to pray this way. Pray that the messengers are delivered from evil people. So we're praying about the message, we're praying about the message, we're praying about the messengers, which may include all of us. Verse 2. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people. For not everyone has faith. It is not a popular position to think that they're indeed wicked and evil people. Do you know that? Most people, and if we took a survey, most people will say that they're good. 
right? If I say, hey, are you evil or good? People will say, well, I'm good. At least compared to that dude, right? There's a large portion of our society that claims that there are no evil people, but only evil circumstance. Here's a quote for you to put on your happy wall. Go to the next slide, please. This is from our friend, who is this? Wallace D. Waddles. There's a name. There are no evil people. There are perfectly good people who are off, are off the track. But they do not need condemnation or punishment. They only need to get upon the rails again. Now, that would be great if it was true. Right? And there's a segment of society that sees all people as good. Everyone's good. They're just bad circumstances. So if we change the circumstances, then people will be changed. Is that true? It'd be nice if it was. And if this sinks into our society very deeply, and it is deeper than you actually think it is, okay? Evil people get to go free because they're victims. Everyone's a victim. According to the Word of God, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, which tells us in this world there are wicked and evil people. Now, I don't want to believe that. I've seen it. I've heard it. I know about it. Do we pray? Absolutely we pray. And Paul is saying, listen, not everyone has faith. So, pray that they be deliver, delivered from evil and wicked people. The truth is that we're all fallen short of the glory of God. Have you ever had to teach your child to do evil? They know how to do it. <laughs> or your dog. <laughs> or your cat. I'm going to talk about why is that? All is fallen short. This is why we need a new heart. This is where the hope of Christ comes to give us a new heart that we grow in godliness. Because if we're not growing in godliness, by default, we grow more wicked. Have you ever taken a um, pile of dirt? When I grew up, we had a pile of dirt in our backyard. If you just wait a little bit, stuff grows in it. Weeds grow by themselves because they're in the soil. If I want something good to come out of that soil, I have to pull it out of the weeds. And I have to plant things that I intentionally want to grow. Right? Same with our lives. <laughs> Given to our own defaults, we don't get better, we get worse. This is why we need God's Spirit to work in us. We're born to pray. That's why we need the grace of God. Everyone needs the grace of God. Don't think that you're better because you've made better choices. You're better because you have the grace of God in you. It's God gets glorified in this. But there are people who would rather choose the lie, right? They'd rather believe what best suits what they want to do. So God gives them over. We saw that. You want that? Then, okay, give them the delusion. We saw that last week. And there's evil and wicked people who oppose the message of the gospel. So he prays, God, deliver us from this because wicked and evil people do damage. I've seen it. It takes place and it is around God. Deliver the messengers of your gospel. Deliver them from wicked people. God, deal with this thing. Yes, we pray that hearts and minds will be changed. I pray that all the time, but I also pray for deliverance. And this is what Paul instructs us to pray. 
pray that the message spreads quickly. Pray that the message is honored deeply. Pray that the messengers are delivered. Now, there's one more thing, and we're going to look at this in the rest of these verses. Honor the word of the Lord. Okay. So I'm asking you to pray, I'm asking you to pray, I'm asking you to pray, then I'm asking you to honor the word of the Lord. So if you look at the text, he's saying, pray for us, Thessalonians, pray for us, pray for us. And then he turns in verse 3 and starts to talk about the Lord. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, talking about them and talking about them in the way that he does because they honored the word of the Lord. This is why this is the, our point, honor the word of the Lord. Verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Subpoint: if you honor the word, go to the next slides, there we go. If you honor the word, then the faithful Lord will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Okay, go back to the verse. But the Lord is faithful, right? So he's saying, pray, pray. Then he talks about the Lord is faithful, and he, the Lord, will do what? Strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Why you? Because you honor the word of the Lord. So when will this take place? It'll take place along the way, and it'll take place on that day. Will the Lord strengthen you during your journey here on earth? Yes. Have you and will you be affected by the evil one? The answer to that question is yes. So what are you saying then? Is God doing a bad job in protecting us from the evil one? Because he seems to be working. So this is future. It is future tense verbs here. He will future which could be along the way, but is especially true in that day. Another word for the devil is accuser. Do you know this? <laughs> Accuse her. Accuser. And he accuses the people of God all the time. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Revelation 12. The accuser who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. What is this saying? That in the day in which we stand in front of God, the accuser says, hey, 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 let me tell you about exhibit A here, my boy. God, did you know that when he was 13 years old, he stole the magazine from 7-Eleven? That was me, by the way. <laughs> hey, hey, Lord, did you know? Let me, let, me, let me see. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You know that he lied to his parents and to his teachers? I was being honest. Oh, you know what? You know what? He started to believe in his own press, and he became really, really full of himself. I'm going to tell you all the times he was proud and arrogant. Guilty. So what do I do on that day? That's the day when God himself, Jesus Christ, who says, yep, I'm guilty, and Jesus says, I'll take his punishment. By the blood of the Lamb, the righteous for the unrighteous. Called the atonement. The accuser will have nothing to say on that day. Not because Dave is good, because Jesus is good. Blood of the Lamb. The word of his testimony. And guess what? He's forgiven. And guess what? I've worked in him and changed him. Degree by degree. Because you honor the word, the faithful one, and because you have faith, the faithful one will strengthen you 
and he will protect you from the evil one. He continues in verse 4. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. Second subpoint: honoring the Lord. If you honor the word, then you will continue to do what it commands. This is why Paul says this in verse 4. If you can go back to verse 4, please. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. Why? Because they honor the word. If you honor the word, you will do the word. Bring about the obedience of faith. Has anyone ever talked about that here? Okay. Bring about the obedience of faith. So if you honor it, you will do it. So therefore, Paul says, hey, I'm confident, he says. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. So doing God's word is a result of honoring God's word. Because if you honor his word, you'll do his word. And if you're not doing his word, the problem often is not you don't hear it, but because you're not honoring it. Does that make sense? Anyone here heard of a musician called Rich Mullins? Anyone? Anyone? One of my favorites. Died in the 90s, not too far away from Rockford, Illinois. Car crash. Dead. It's a sad day for me because I loved his music. Still love his music. There's a song called Creed that he wrote, and I encourage you to listen to it. <clears throat> it's not the band Creed. That's a whole different thing. The song Creed. There's a line in it that goes, I did not make it. That's the word of God. I did not make it. No, it is making me. It's the very truth of God and not the invention of any man. If we don't make the word, the word makes us. You can pray anything for you, for you who are churchgoers. If you'd honor the word. Honor the word. Now check this out, what he says next. And this is more prayer, okay? So those of you who say, yes, I need urgency. Yes, I need honoring. Yes, I'm going to pray. And he does a little prayer for them in verse 5. And for us. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Next sub-point. If you honor the word, then pray that your heart will be directed into God's love. Some people use the word as a club to beat other people up with. But some of you come from churches and places that do that? Bam, 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 bam. Is the word truth? Yes, but it is saturated in the love of God. If we read scripture and we see the truth but we don't comprehend the love, we have a problem. Do you see God's love in the Old Testament where God delivered his people time and time again or all you see is God's judgment? God judged the world through a flood, yes, but he saved us through a righteous man named Noah. God delivered his people who were in bondage and brought his judgment on Egypt, but delivered his people through the passing of a sea, through a passing of a river, through passing down his words to them. He delivered them, God's love. I want you, and the prayer is, that when you read scripture, this is back to verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts 
more than your mind. It's what you think, but who you are. May you direct your hearts into God's love. That we would be seeing God's love through Scripture. We'll be seeing God's love through what is written. We'd be experiencing that love, and that would transform our heart with God's truth. It'll be coupled with God's love. And Christ's perseverance. Last sub-point. If you honor the word, then pray that your heart will be directed into Christ's perseverance. Christianity takes perseverance. Why? Because life is difficult. Sometimes you fall down and hit your head. Sometimes you have a cancer diagnosis. Sometimes your parents don't treat you well. Sometimes pastors abuse kids. Sometimes there's evil that goes on all the time. This world is under a curse. Sometimes car accidents take place. Sometimes children fall away. Sometimes our heart is lured and enticed by all types of of temptations, pray that our hearts will be directed into Christ's perseverance. Did Christ persevere to the end? Right? Absolutely. He could have at some point says, you know what, see y'all, I'm tired of you. He persevered to the end. Even saying, God, may your will be done, but if it's possible, will this cup pass from me? But God, not my will, but yours be done persevered until the end, and coupling this with chapter 2, we are to continue to persevere until he comes again. It's not how you start Christianity that ultimately matters. It's how you finish. Come on. How you finish. How you finish. So we pray for this. Honor the word of the Lord. And the Lord of the Word will honor you. Honor the Word of the Lord, and the Lord of the Word will honor you. So I'm coming into a landing, and we're going to do communion. But listen. This is what I'm asking. This is what the Holy Spirit's asking. This is what God himself is asking you. Pray, not out of obligation, not not you're trying to to, to make me or anybody else happy. You pray because God, you're meeting with him and his love compels you. Pray, come on, put it down, get up early, carve out some time. Pray, I'm asking you to pray. Pray. Giving you practically some things to pray for. Pray the message spreads rapidly. Pray that the message is honored deeply. Pray that the messengers will be delivered daily. Pray that we would honor the Lord through his word. And where are you at, Jack? Where are you at? Are are you reading this? I collect the word. I don't read it. Stop collecting. Start reading. Why? Because through it, then you will honor it. You'll obey it. And if you obey it, God's work will work in you. So this is what I'm asking you to do. The book of Jude, and I'm going to end with this, and we're going to do communion. One chapter. This is our prayer. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all times and now and forever. Amen.